Hello everyone, my name is Jan and I am host of Gifts of the Weird and I am hoping to make my very first video of a review of an Oracle deck, one that I, um, the Viking Oracle deck by Stacy DeMarco and one that I'm uh, just kind of looking forward to doing this with ev uh, everyone and hopefully it will turn out well. Uh, some friends of mine said that I should uh, do a uh, Oracle review on YouTube because other people have as well and I did one for my podcast which is called Gifts of the Weird and I thought well why not go ahead and uh, give a shot at it and try to do it um, with video so we'll see how that goes <laughs> that's my first time and I hope I am able to do this so I am going to be uh, reviewing the Viking Oracle deck by Blue Angel Publishing and it's uh, by Stacy DeMarco and Jimmy Manton um, Stacy is the um, author and Jimmy Mountain is the artist. So I thought um, it's a Viking Oracle and being how I run a heathen podcast called Gifts of the Weird. Um, I said that already, didn't I? <laughs> so I'm a little nervous. Um, it's a podcast about inclusive heathenry and it covers topics uh, that are relevant to modern practices today. Uh, creating safe space for people of uh, who the gods call to worship um, and, and it's, a, it's a safe space without bigotry so and it's also about honoring our gods and the whites of the uh, northern lands the dramatic northern lands uh, so that's it it's available at um, gifts of the weird uh, dot com or gifts of the weird dot pod dot com that's the the podcasting host and I also have Twitter which is at weird gifts and I have a Facebook page at gifts of the weird and uh, gifts of the weird dot com is my uh, website so I hope that um, maybe some folks will come and listen to me I've got some episodes up and I try to get at least a month uh, uh, episode a month out so uh, hopefully uh, we'll see uh, hear some of you uh, coming over and taking a listen if you have an interest in uh, modern practices and modern heathenry so on to the review with the uh, Viking Oracle uh, I saw this uh, come up in my uh, Amazon feed probably late in the fall last year and I thought well that looks pretty interesting I'm not quite sure what it what it will entail or how it will be because uh, you know, it's it's an oracle deck for one thing, so that's kind of interesting. I love working with oracle decks. I do work with runes. I've worked with runes for uh, several years now, and I've studied a lot of rune, the Elder Futhark mainly of the runes, and expanding into uh, Anglo-Saxon and other rune studies. And um, uh, but I do use oracle decks, and I've actually used um, Stacy and Jimmy's uh, Halloween oracle deck, and I think it's really good. And I've used other oracle decks as well. Uh, and uh, I think oral um, divination and oracle decks and tarot and runes and oem are all great areas of divination. Each brings a different perspective. They connect to us culturally. They connect to us through our our relationships with our gods. So um, very very different types of divination tools are amazing. Cards, stones, wood, plastic, um, glass, beads. You have it. Uh, anything I think can be um, a valid oracle uh, tool uh, to whoever is being the person that is speaking through that the gods and goddesses are speaking through to use that item. So uh, that's very important uh, for me to to understand for me to share with folks is that hey there's different kinds of oracles so with the Viking Oracle I'm also a Viking reenactor so I thought wow that seems pretty interesting let's check it out. Uh, and then January came along. I think the the deck came out about that time, or maybe in late December. And um, life happened, so I wasn't able to get a hold of it. I finally did. Uh, went on to YouTube and saw some uh, videos from some folks. Um, one that really I like to really acknowledge and say thanks for your videos is the uh, the Norse Tarot uh, Witch and. Uh, had a really uh, nice unboxing with that. Got to see all of the cards before I purchased them, and then got to hear uh, his review of it. Plus, I, I checked in with a couple of other reviews and unboxing, and just got a chance to see them. So, um, first of all, the boxes. Uh, I'll do what most people do is I'll talk about all aspects of it. So the box is really nice. It's sturdy. It's um, a good size for everything. And one of the things that I pointed out that I think is really cool is if you look on each. 
uh, side of the box, it tells you what it is. So if you happen to store it on your uh, bookshelf somewhere, uh, like this or like this, um, like this, um, you'll know what it is, and that's that's a great idea. Plus, uh, it comes in a, a sturdy box. It's nice to have a uh, a sturdier box that's um, protect the cards, protect the book, keep it all contained so that uh, you don't have to worry about them getting mis misplaced or, or or lost or whatever. But it's also nice. So uh, we'll pull it out. Uh, this is not going to be an unboxing. I'm not going to show every single card and uh, all of that, but uh, we will talk about those cards as we go along. Here's the book. It's really nice. I'm going to excuse me while I look down at some notes. Uh, uh, well, first of all, let's talk about St Stacy and Jimmy. Uh, Stacy um, has uh, created a lot of different decks. Among them are the Goddesses and Sirens, the Gods and Titans, the Halloween Oracle, and the Gospel of Aradia. And Jimmy Manton has done the artwork for all of those decks as well as some Isis oracles with another author and Stacy I believe has done some other oracle decks as well so um, they uh, both are very um, they work well together and they have put a lot of decks out into the divination uh, field so here's the book uh, it's got a nice glossy cover a nice bind it's um, four and a half by six and a quarter yeah, 123 pages, and um, it's a actually uh, the type is a really nice, nice type. It's easy to read. The pages are not too bright, uh, uh, white, so uh, just a just a little bit off color, which makes them uh, makes it a really easy read actually. And I like one of the things that I really like is that on most of her cards and explanations, she tries to at least do it in the same spread or the same two page spread here so that you don't have like starting on this page and then all of a sudden it turns over and finishes on there uh, so she does try to, to get the whole uh, amount in there some of it carries over to a third page or sometimes just on the way the card or the pages go you, you can't help it but most of them you've got the first uh, first page and then it's completed on the second page uh, the book nice contact contents page tells you where everything is and um, introduction uh, kind of tells story, Stacy's story why she wanted to make the deck and um, what was in her influences a little, you know, learn a little bit about her how she's always kind of been drawn to the the Norse gods and goddesses the Norse pantheon so Kind of interesting to learn the, the behind the scenes type of thing, what, what led up to the, to the thing. So uh, sh in the how to use the thing, she has um, spreads. Uh, it's, uh, there's no unique spreads here really. Um, she has a couple with a couple of different names, um, trying to make it Viking uh, Viking uh, Vikingized or <laughs> trying to make it sound like it uh, um, relates to the heathen oracle. Uh, but really it's not much so you've got just the basic one card uh, and the three card spread which uh, you see in any oracle deck uh, and or tarot uh, which is good for learning the the cards um, a card a day or just starting off with three um, the, the interesting the nice thing about um, oracle cards is the more cards you put out the more complete story you get uh, you can always just do something with one card but um, to me I think um, you don't kind of get the whole story so it's nice to have a little bit more spread she has a nine card spread she, um, here's where she's trying to make it like a, uh, let it fit into the pantheon into the Viking world by calling it the nine world spread but really it doesn't have anything to do with the nine worlds that I can tell at least she doesn't address it in here maybe she assigned each card to one of the worlds and pulled out some of the energies from that world but she doesn't explain it in here so if that's the intent you have to really either stretch it pull it out yourself or uh, but she didn't tell it and it's just got basic like what is the higher reasoning what can I learn from this what action do I need to take very very normal uh, types of positions that 
any any book. It's interchangeable. Any books uh, or with any Oracle deck or Tarot is going to have that in there. Um, another thing that she has in there is called the uh, Thor's Hammer. Again, it's just a, a number of cards here that she has placed out there. She calls it the Thor's Hammer, but uh, other than that, has no significance to Thor, no significance to the gods. Again, it's uh, the expression of the issue, heart of the issue, what's the obstacle, what's my solution, what's the future outcome. So uh, it doesn't have any real bearing on whether it's Viking or not. It's just a, tip, uh, a normal spread that you can use for any divination technique. It's a nice spread. It works well. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Um, the next one that she has here is called the Past, Present, and Future. Uh, it's just three cards, uh, three by three. Uh, another nine card spread, and you just read the, the, the top three as a past, the middle three as the present, the bottom three as the future. So it's basically um, kind of like three card spread. You just have more cards to help you tell the story. And uh, typically when I do rune readings, I do, do a, nine, a nine rune spread like this that um, with that same um, that same layout and pretty much um, calling on the Norns uh, to help me work with that. So let's go right into the cards. Uh, the cards are broken up uh, or the the deck actually is kind of two part or two fold. It's um, the, uh, in the numbering system of the cards, um, we have the, the runes, the Elder Futhark runes, and we have uh, additional cards, which are oracle cards. Uh, these are cards that she's pulled out some images, some gods and goddesses, and made some meanings uh, to, of the cards based on the stories of the god goddess, uh, the item that she's picked out uh, to have uh, a divinatory meaning. Uh, and uh, she also has um, the Elder Futhark runes. Part of one of the the first things that triggered my skepticism about the deck was that she calls it the 25 Nordic runes and um, most almost all heathen study of the runes there aren't there isn't 25 Elder Futhark runes uh, generally they call it the blank rune there is no blank rune it's like there's no blank alphabet letter and um, so what I'm going to do with this is, uh, this is the blank, it's called the void. Um, I'm going to place that in with the oracle sign because uh, in my studies and in my practice, it's not a room. So I'm not going to um, deal with that there. But w what we do have is the Elder Futhark cards. And um, we'll go through, first of all, the, just the Elder Futhark. And I'm not going to go through each card and each meaning and, and dissect how she places it. Um, I'm just going to kind of go over them in batches. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll go from there as well as with the Oracle cards. Uh, one thing to note about the book is that she has the meaning of the card. And she has a poem. And then she has further text of the card. And then for the runes, she has, for some of them, a reverse meaning. And uh, as when it comes to the uh, the rune or, or the poem that she has assigned here, it's not the typical rune poems that come with uh, that we have from um, sources. Uh, it is looks like it's possibly one that she created herself, uh, but she doesn't say so. So um, I'm assuming it's hers because she's the author of the book. But if it was written by another person, um, she didn't give that person credit, so I don't know. So that's why I'm pretty sure that um, it's hers. Nice room poems, or nice poems. There's poems for the oracle cards as well. But it is, um, it's nice. So, uh, and uh, I can't really comment on it because I don't really get into poetry. Poetry goes like way over my head. Uh, so it's it's kind of tough for me to do that, but the the poems are are well written and well constructed, and I think that uh, they really come from her heart, which is really nice. So um, the uh, so on to the runes. We have the uh, we'll start off with um, the explanations of the runes. Um, most of the explanations that she has um, are pretty generically the runes, uh, the generic meanings, or the, the uh, or maybe she's taken several different 
meanings from different authors and kind of mesh them together, probably interspersed some of her own ideas and some of her own revelations as to what it is, place it in with that, that rune meaning. Then um, in the, she gives the pronunciation of the rune, um, how to say it, and also uh, then she goes on to elaborate a little bit more of the text, a little the background behind the rune, maybe some of the things that apply to help explain the meanings. Uh, when it comes to the reversals, uh, I do not use reversals, and I so I, I did read a lot of the reversals, but after a while, it just kind of got to the point where it just sounded like she was saying, uh, basically, just turns over the meaning of the the card. So, um, if that's all it is, I really didn't um, follow through too much on that. And since I don't use reversals, I think that the runes have enough of the story to have reversals even within the same rune depending on the divination and how the gods and goddesses are leading you while you're in divination you can um, find different aspects of the rune that you don't need it to be turned upside down in order for it to have those other um, meanings or those other opportunities uh, for the rune to teach us a lesson and uh, so I kind of just discounted it after a while I um, just stopped looking at them uh, most of the time, the reversals had very little to do with the main part of the rune, or at least that was my impression, and I just uh, kind of moved on after that. So what we'll start with, uh, and that goes on through the oracle as well. Um, the oracle has a meaning, has a, a poem, and then it has further amplifying text, uh, background about the god or goddess. Maybe she brings in one of the stories about uh, the gods or how this goddess affected this or what they work with so just a little bit more of a background on that um, and that's how that goes so when we come to the cards themselves um, overall out of the 45 cards we've got 12 uh, female images uh, not all of the females appear to be goddesses so uh, that's why I'm just saying female so that includes goddesses and uh, generic female images. Uh, same with the males, there's 11 of those. There's 14 objects which may or may not, or which may include an animal of some sort. I just kind of lump those all together. And then there's eight specific just rune images that uh, uh, don't fall into one of the others when it's part of the Elder Futhark rune. So that's that part there. And um, we'll move on to the cards. I'm going to move the, the, the uh, camera here just a tad so that we can uh, hopefully I'll, I'll put all these up here and we'll be able to see so let's see how that goes all right so what we have here are the first of all the rune cards I'll move this in a little bit no, we won't do that try to do this sorry I try to figure all this out ahead of time <laughs> That just um, it just was taking so much time I wanted to just get going. So here we have, um, and these aren't going to be in order because what I've done is I've grouped them into the the different um, groupings of the root within the runes. And within the runes we've got uh, five female, five male, seven objects, and then the rune images. And so We'll just start with the female images, uh, ladies first. That's what I was always taught. So we'll just kind of go on with that. Uh, let see if I can bring this in a little tighter. There we go. Okay. No, well, that's a little blurry, isn't it? Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, so um, all of the rune cards, first of all, have the rune symbol, one on each side. And then it has the rune name below it. Uh, so in here this is Urus and uh, we have uh, as with uh, all of them we just have a um, this is a, f a figure and the first thing to point out is that um, this is a Viking Oracle so uh, one would expect them to be dressed in Viking clothing and none of them appear to be really in authentic Viking era clothing um, beautiful clothing. Uh, Jimmy Manton did a really beautiful job with his artwork. The uh, colors are great, the detail is nice, uh, and um, 
I, you know, the backgrounds are, are beautiful. They are, they can be uh, very, very gorgeous cars, really, really nicely done. The uh, problem is, is that it's not Viking um, garb. Um, I did send some of the images to my co-Viking reenacting um, friend, and she is a uh, very avid about um, Viking gear and Viking clothing, and uh, has been even to Denmark to uh, to study some of the. Uh, the the finds and the digs and the reenactment groups and uh, she uh, she says yeah they're very pretty uh, they look kind of Celtic or Grecian or Roman but they are not Viking era so that's um, kind of strike number one I wish they would have put a little more research into that and uh, actually put some period clothing on them they're beautiful but they are not uh, Viking uh, period uh, so as you can see, uh, this is Thorisaz. Uh, this is this is really weird because Thorisaz is about the the thorn or the hammer, the hammer of Thorn Mjolnir. And here we have this um, gorgeous lady on here, but um, not sure what she has to do with Thorisaz. And uh, Demarco Stacy Demarco did not uh, make uh, any connections with the of the artwork to the card or the or the images. Uh, in the runes, so um, we have we're only left up to our imagination. The only thing I can think of is this is Thor when he dressed up as Freya in order to go get Mjolnir back from the giants with Loki. So um, otherwise, um, beautiful um, non-Pyrian um, garb, but it's beautiful costume. And uh, another interesting thing is um, the winged helmets that they're all um, wearing, kind of evoking of Richard Wagner. In the Ring of the Valkyries and all of that. So here we have Winyo, again a beautiful um, image. Um, Solo. Uh, Solo is about the sun help, um, but if you just look at the image, you wouldn't know that. Um, well, another interesting thing about these is these um, ladies have no expressions on their faces, and they're always just either standing hands out or stand hands by their side. And uh, to me, they just kind of look like mannequins. Um, sporting these really beautiful costumes or um, there's just no life, no expression, nothing. They don't evoke anything. Um, again, it's beautiful cloak. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people would love to have that, but um, nothing to do with so well, all, except maybe it's yellow, has yellow in it, but um, uh, disappointing actually a little bit that they didn't put a little more effort into how if they wanted to have a goddess represent um, part of it or somehow bring out that that gnosis that 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 inspiration then then explain that and and put that in there but uh, Dagas uh, which means day uh, beautiful card again but nothing to do with the room so um, and again um, just uh, expressionless um, nothing to evoke any energy spirit or power um, and these are just generic female images. We we have no connections to who they could be or might be. Um, one could make up stuff, and you could take the cards and um, pull out your own divination and your own inspiration and see if um, maybe one of the goddesses would come through and say, okay, that's going to be me uh, representing Uru's, Uru's of strength. Uh, but um, otherwise, um, it's not done with just the card and if you're going to be making a card with the uh, the runes or an oracle deck it should help evoke what the meaning of the card is I would think somehow um, when you're doing one like this here we have the male figures uh, this is Fehu, Fehu is the first of the runes um, there you go and uh, Fehu means cattle but you wouldn't know that the only thing you could kind of tell that this is cattle is maybe from the headdress um, but there again, you're reaching. Otherwise, it's just a very well done, well drawn man, um, masculine, muscular, bearded, uh, but um, nothing to do with the rune really. Here we have Hagalas. Hagalas is about hail. Um, 
I guess you could stretch and try to figure out some way to make this reach, but otherwise, uh, very impressive, very well done as far as artwork, but um, not connecting to the rune. Here, this is the card for Yura. Uh, this is the closest to being connected to the rune with the sickle. Oops, going the wrong way. And uh, indicating harvest, which is what the uh, the year of rune represents is harvest or the cycle, the, the, the cycle of growth, uh, things like that. But um, other than that, he's not even in like um, harvesting garb. Um, that's a very fancy outfit. It's not period to Viking. <laughs> it's not what a Viking would wear or a Viking, a person of the Viking era. But um, there you go. Uh, it's um, uh, the closest thing to that. Uh, this is the rune for Elhaz. Um, here we're getting a little beefcakey, I think. Um, very nicely done. Um, it doesn't seem to be. There we go. Uh, sorry, it didn't seem to be uh, focusing uh, right there. Very nicely done, but um, Elhaz represents protection or the elk's edge. And uh, I don't see protection here. I see an embrace, um, but. Uh, not protection, and again, it doesn't seem, it's not a um, period uh, to the Viking era. Actually, it looks like he's probably sporting a kilt, uh, which would be Celtic. Kind of interesting. And um, I can't see anyone that would be able to sport those kind of hand, uh, those kind of antlers for any length of time. Um, here we have Manas. Manas is about community and humanity. Um, very well done. Um, nice looking figure here. Um, I always connect Heimdall um, to um, Manas because Heimdall was the, um, the the god who came down and and helped sort out humanity and figure out um, you know the different skill sets that we have and how we interact with one another and work together you know with our our farmers and uh, the people who are kind of the uh, own the farms but not very wealthy and then you have the very wealthy people and then uh, how we all kind of work together but uh, Manas still very impressive I mean very well done actually I think he I think Jimmy Manton did a better job on drawing the the masculine figures the men than he did the women because they have some sort of at least they have um, expressions and um, different types of poses although they're kind of either profiled or kind of turned to the side, but at least you've got some expressions here. Um, well, not there, you can't tell. Uh, but um, unfortunately with women, he didn't do that. So these don't look like they're mannequins, they actually look like kind of posing for, uh, or getting ready to do something. So now we're getting into the objects part of the the Elder Futhark runes. We have Ansu's. Um, this is a really kind of a creepy one, I have no idea. <laughs> what this is supposed to be. It's a, a bust or on the top of a column. It's a sort of a winged headdress thing. Uh, Ansu's uh, deals with communications. It comes from the rune, uh, the rune poem where uh, the, the word is os or os meaning God and um, and communication I guess because of his mouth is open you can say that and usually it's connected to Odin. But this is not Odin, because Odin is typically depicted with just one eye. So this is weird. Um, I don't know what it's about, how it has anything to do with Ansu's. So um, it's unfortunate. And, you know, obviously he drew a feather falling out. Um, but, again, he, they did not talk about what this meant in the, in the text. So we have no idea. And that's too bad. Uh, that might have helped out a lot. Uh, this is the rune Kanaz. This is probably one of the best representations because Kanaz means torch, and it's a torch. So very well done, yay! Finally, one that works. Uh, this is a strange one. Gabo means gift. Uh, first, I looked at it and I'm like, wow, what has a fish got to do with Gabo? Uh, don't even know what this is. And then I kind of looked at it, oops, on its side, and it looks like it's supposed to be a drinking horn. It's just a very um, sharply turned horn. I have none of my horns. I've never seen horns that sharp before. They're usually a little bit more uh, pointed down like this. So um, executed well, but um, composition-wise, not the best. Uh, this is for Iwas. 
Again, these images have very little to do. The only thing that might have anything to do with IWAS is the arrows because IWAS represents the yew tree and arrows were generally made from yew uh, branches, but otherwise uh, very little to do with IWAS. Um, this, like Kanaz, the torch, great representation, Perthro, or Perthos uh, means dice cup. So you've got dice and a cup. Perfect. Uh, this is Burkano. Burkano uh, represents fertility and growth, and it appears to be a seed that is sprouted, and you see its full potential as being a full tree. Uh, which is a really good representation for Burkano. Um, she didn't connect that in the artwork, but um, I can see that in there, which is really good. However, uh, Burkano is also really connected with the goddess Frigga, so this would have been a great opportunity to connect that with her. Uh, this still could have been on there, but you could have had Frigga in the background or something to deal with fertility and, and Frigga. Uh, on that as well, especially since she wasn't in any of the other, she wasn't one of the goddesses selected for later. So, great opportunity here. This is for the rune Awaz. Awaz does um, kind of mean, it means partnership, but it also means horse. So, uh, at least we've got a, another connection there. So, three out of um, all that we've seen so far. Uh, then we come into the last part of the runes and we get into the uh, uh, the remaining ones and basically what I think here is either laziness or not getting into time or they ran out of time but um, they basically just drew a rune on a tapestry or a scroll or something and uh, or a stone and uh, uh, to me I think if you're making an oracle deck with uh, and you've got such a talented artist like Jimmy Manton uh, why would you waste it on uh, on some of these on just drawing the rune itself even though um, they kind of got creative by creating a stone um, although um, <laughs> you've basically recycled this background we'll see it later in the oracle side so that was kind of odd um, but missed opportunity again here we have Tiwaz, Tiwaz represents the god Tyr sacrifice and justice and, no, uh, and rightness um, perfect opportunity to bring another god into the deck and deal with uh, some of his qualities and aspects to help you understand the rune but um, lost. Um, this is Isa, um, means ice, the only thing you got on here is snow so I guess that's a connection but uh, pretty loosely, pretty flimsy one at best. Lagus is water, uh, here we have Ingus Another missed, greatly missed opportunity, uh, this is the companion rune to Burkano. It is the, the rune for the god Ing, or Frey, most commonly known as Frey. And another great opportunity for them to have utilized Manton's uh, skill and created a, uh, a card for Frey, because again, they didn't choose him for the oracle later. So she had so many more opportunities with the runes to bring in more of the pantheon and more of the culture around the worship of the gods and the whites, and uh, it was lost. Finally, we end, this is the final rune, which is Othala. And um, another reason why I think it was a waste of time to do the rune image up here is because you've got the rune image down here, and you've got the name. So. Um, don't really need it here and it's not that I'm I don't think that rune cards with just rune images are not valuable uh, it's just it's not necessary because you've got it all down here and uh, when you're doing an oracle with such a talented artist as I said earlier and you've got so much uh, going on with an oracle deck especially when she recommends that they mix the runes together for an oracle reading um, it's just, um, I, I, you're going to hear it like a broken record, lost opportunity. And um, especially when none of the, or very very few of these cards, except for those object cards that I pointed out earlier, those, what, three? Um, you have no idea, just based on the picture, um, what, it, what, what energy, what meaning you can bring out of the rune itself. So um, to me, that was too bad. Um, 
the cards are not valueless, um, and we'll talk about that later, but um, I just think uh, they could have been better. So let's move on to the Oracle side. Uh, the Oracle deck itself, um, this is the 21 remaining cards. Uh, we have um, up here now, we have um, the Void, which um, I which they call the blank rune or the 25th rune, but it's not, so um, not going to, uh, uh, that's why I shipped it over to the Oracle. The cards consist of 13 human figures, uh, 7 female, 6 male, and uh, 2 scenes, and 6 objects. And we'll just kind of briefly go over those in the same manner. Um, and uh, the artwork is consistent. Uh, Man Manton is very talented. Um, this actually is really a beautiful card. I would love to have this as a painting on the wall. Uh, but um, in the uh, in the deck, um, nothing really to explain why it means that. Uh, we'll go back to the um, goddesses of the deck. Here we have Freya. Again, just kind of posing there, standing there, expressionless. Uh, some of the more, uh, come on, focus, sorry. I don't know why it's not focusing. There we go. Some of the more things that, the things that she's known for are not present on this card. For instance, she wear, has a cloak of falcon feathers. Um, I guess you could stretch and say that might be her cloak, but actually it looks like fur to me, not feathers. Uh, she's not wearing um, Brisingalman, her golden necklace that she um, got from the dwarves. Uh, there are no cats here pulling her chariot, and um, she's known for that. There's nothing that would evoke her connection to um, obtaining half of the slain. From the battlefields or for her sage and, and sorcery magic that she is home of uh, her love connection uh, she's a goddess of passion and love I mean she Freya is so multifaceted there's so much they could have done and you, you just miss that here and again it's Viking Oracle but she's not wearing Viking outfits um, so if you're going to uh, call for a Viking Oracle uh, then at least try to be um, consistent or, and period authentic. Uh, again, winged helmets, winged headdresses, um, more from uh, Wagner, Richard Wagner, the opera, than um, uh, actual um, historical significance. Uh, this was a really disappointing card. This is Hell or Hela, um, goddess. She's Loki's daughter, uh, the goddess of Hell and our ancestors. And um, here she is wearing some kind of funky horned headdress, and um, kind of I kind of looked at it as um, uh, maybe it was a hot day and they were just kind of drooping. Um, but um, she's a little bit pale, so maybe that's how you can connect her to dead. She's got red eyes. She looks more like a vampire than she does the goddess of hell. And Hela, the unique thing about Hela is. Um, she should be depicted as um, half beautiful and half decaying. Um, that is very specific to who she is and and um, and her place as the goddess of hell, the goddess of the dead, the goddess of our ancestors. Uh, so that is not in here. Again, what's with the outstretched arms? It's not very not very appropriate to the card or to help you understand anything. But it is a beautiful costume and uh, really unique and wonderful. Uh, who might you think this is? Uh, well, you might think she's the sister of Hell because they look like twins actually. Um, I kind of like the Maleficent um, horns, but um, this is supposed to be the giantess Scotty. And again, um, not much connection to who she is. Uh, the only thing that you have is a wolf. But that's really stretching it to be able to figure out that it's Scotty. Or, or oh, she's blue, meaning that she's cold or ice, icy. Uh, but otherwise, uh, the things that are tell, uh, telling about uh, Scotty is she's the goddess of the hunt. Uh, she's the goddess of winter. Uh, she does skiing and snowshoeing. And she is the wife of New York's. Um, Stacy goes into it in the... Uh, goes into a lot, uh, pulls out stories about each of the goddesses 
and, and brings those aspects out of it, but you would not be able to know that this was Scotty. You might be able to guess. Someone who knows the, uh, the stories about Scotty might be able to guess that, but uh, um, otherwise, not much to evoke that. Um, here, one could guess that's supposed to be Sunna, or as they call her, Soul. Um, mostly just because there's a, a sun image here, a sun image here. Otherwise, nothing to depict that that's Sunna or Soul. Uh, she's she carries the sun in a chariot across the sky um, with her two horses, and she's being chased by two wolves. Um, she's just kind of again a mannequin posing for this beautiful cloak. Again, uh, Manton did a great job with the costuming. I think he's, I mean, he's a cost. He can be a great costume designer. A lot of that is just beautiful and amazing stuff. It would be great to see it actually produced. Um, this is another disappointing card. It's the Norns. Um, I figured it out immediately because I'm familiar with the stories. I know the Lorns, the Norns. I've worked with them. I uh, visit them in my safe work. Uh, so that's how I was able to successfully guess that it was the Norns. But again, outstretched arms, mannequins posing for these cloaks, which are pretty cool. Uh, but um, nothing else would tell you that it's the Norns. Um, Earth, Verdandi, and Skold are of various ages. Uh, these all look to be the same, a young woman, and, um, and it depicts them actually up in the upper branches of a tree, or possibly, and this looks like the Yggdrasil card that we'll see later, but they're actually at the roots uh, tending to the Well of Weird, so this is just not a very good, uh, he just looks like he just recycled the background so that he could put them on it, but uh, they should be at the root, uh, under the under the root of the tree, uh, because they water the roots with the well of weird. So um, missed opportunity, not good. Uh, this is probably the closest you're going to get to uh, any representation. It's about Valkyries, um, but again, you have these big winged headdresses. This very strange looking bird, I guess, to indicate the death on the battlefield. Uh, and but still mannequin posing there, carrying a staff. Um, I would think bearing a pretty awesome sword would have been good, but that's a small thing. But um, otherwise, uh, just the same complaints. Um, beautifully done, executed. Um, his detail is very good, um, but I don't think he studied out what a Valkyrie is and what they do, and because they could have pulled that out more in the text. So let's move on to the uh, male, or the gods of the cards. Um, on, uh, one of the missed things is this is Fenrir. Fenrir is a wolf, not a man. I guess what they wanted to do was bring the wolf aspect out of it in the, um, the shield. There's a wolf there in his headdress. That would be a cool headdress. Love to have it, but uh, again, you don't get to really check out the <clears throat> connection to Fenrir. Uh, this is also the image used for the back of the card, which is a really nice image. Uh, if anything, the cards are very beautiful and they're beautifully designed, so they are great. Um, now, who might you think that is? Well, probably a lot of people will guess because you figure that you've got to have him in the card and that's Loki. Um, again, nicely done. Uh, here's that strange horn. Um, that would be very strange to drink out of, and I can't imagine what animal that would have come from. I guess that it's possible. I don't know, but um, but this is Loki. Um, so here we have uh, Omani, um, god of the moon. Uh, he uh, looks too much of a warrior to be Mani, uh, based on my studies. Uh, I could be uh, not so right, but he pulls the moon across the sky in a chariot, following or ahead of Sol or Sunna, his sister. And he also, likewise, is chased by wolves. But um, the only thing that you're going to get out of this that it's Mani is the fact that there's a moon back there. And uh, kind of expressionless, I, I think maybe he lost his his uh, interest in um, making them or just there were so many he just didn't know how to make them all different 
but um, Monty is not typically known. I have I could be wrong, but I do not know of him carrying a big giant battle axe like that. So um, not really the best of representations. This one's obvious, Odin, uh, and as I described in the podcast, he looks like he's posing for a mantle painting. Uh, those are some pretty uh, big gams there on him, the big biceps. Uh, the costuming, possibly somewhat Viking related, but actually it looks more Celtic, more of the islands, the, the Celtic islands over there. And again, the Wagner style giant headdresses. One of the things on the back of the box that they claimed they were going to do was moving beyond stereotypes of warriors and raiders and delving into the extraordinary Norse mythos and the intricate and powerful belief systems of this ancient people. Uh, I think they threw that all, I think that sounds good, but they threw it all out the window because here they're going for the typical stereotypical stuff. That's not even accurate to the period. Um, by throwing in these winged helmets and these winged headdresses, these horned headdresses, stuff like that. Uh, this mix mash of Grecian, Roman, Celtic costuming that has nothing to do with uh, Viking era clothing uh, for the Viking era people. Um, just Google that and you'll see the style of clothing they wore, which can be very elaborate and maybe they thought it was not as interesting to depict, but um, I think it is. Uh, this one, uh, you can figure it out fairly well. Red beard, a hammer is Thor. Uh, not a bad depiction, uh, again, for the uh, period and what they're trying to evoke for the Germanic lands. The, the clothing is wrong, but wow, it is a really an impressive looking piece. And actually, um, I think it's one of the better of the, the gods that they depicted. So we finished with the gods. Now we're going into the final, which is the scenes and the objects. Uh, recognize this. This was used before. This is for Frithgerd. Um, and um, I think they missed it because Frithgerd is about a, a holy place or a private place. And I would think that you would, or, or even a grove, um, I think that this is too vast an expanse to, uh, to represent that. Um, but, um, yeah, but it is a beautiful drawing. And we did see it on the background, some of other cards. Here we have, uh, recognize this guy, this looks like the Ansu's guy, close his mouth and he's breaking up. Uh, this is Ragnarok, uh, which is the end of the, it's the final battle of the gods with the giants. Uh, Loki betrays them uh, and they uh, battle it out and the gods are killed and then re uh, the, a new set of gods is born. And uh, But again, uh, other than it breaking up, you don't really have any idea that it's something to do with Ragnarok. Kind of interesting. We're getting into the objects here, and I'll go a little quickly because um, they're well enough done. A sunstone. Um, oh, except for this one, the Nine Worlds. Um, this is the Nine Worlds card. I counted seven, possibly eight. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, and it looks like seven and eight. Now, the only other thing that I can think of is maybe this is actually three of the worlds and that would be nine but um, if you're gonna if you're gonna say it's the nine worlds kind of be clear about it um, these are just globes um, these three would be kind of easy to figure out what they belong to maybe this is hell uh, these two uh, twin costs are twin costs coin tosses to who they belong to uh, just not well done, not a well represented card. They could have, um, Matten could have done better. And Stacy DeMarco could have um, done, uh, brought the research out a little bit better for it. Uh, this is um, a nice card. It's called The Halls. Works with what they do. Uh, it's just a guy standing there. Um, he has no significance. She didn't assign him as a, one of the gods. He's just kind of there. Falls in with whatever the, the meaning means. Uh, this is the thing, meaning friendship and uh, loyalty and connection, things like that. Uh, again, not too bad. It's just, just a handshake, so uh, kind of hard to mess that up, so they did a good job. Uh, this was another strange one. It's called um, Fegvisir. Fegvisir is 
Um, if you don't know what it is, you wouldn't, but it is this uh, talisman sigil that's tattooed on her head. It's called the Viking Compass, and it was used for protection. Um, here it's just tattooed on her head for what reason, we don't know. There's nothing to connect the art. That's one of my biggest disappointments is that she doesn't connect the art to the cards. Um, you just kind of you're just left up to yourself to figure it out. This is the well of weird. At least it's at the roots uh, of a tree, uh, and you would just imagine that's Yggdrasil. But here, no Norns. It doesn't even look like a well. It's just a blue circle. But I understand artistic license and interpretation, so I'm not that nitpicky about it. At least it's it's at the roots where it should be. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Yggdrasil. Uh, remember this? We had this on the back of um, one of the uh, of the Norns. Uh, oh, and look at the back here. There's the card that they use for Frith Guard. So um, I guess he ran out of time, or just didn't feel very imaginative. I don't know. Um, this is Yggdrasil, supposedly. Um, the leaves are yellow. To me, that would indicate fall. They're about ready to fall off. Um, I'm not quite sure that that's ever happened with Yggdrasil. Uh, normally, I, I always would think it would be green and um, um, vibrant. Um, if you did want to depict it, Yggdrasil, um, you can have um, the squirrel running up and down it or the um, antelopes in there eating the leaves or somehow f figuring out how it's connected to the nine worlds. Uh, but um, it's a tree, so you can't be too critical of it, but I just think it didn't doesn't really evoke what it should uh, when it comes to it. One of the other um, disappointing things I have with the Stacy's artwork or uh, um, writing in the book is she doesn't make any connection as to where in the the stories and the lore that it comes from, and um, or when she makes claims that oh the ancients did this. Um, we don't know where she's getting that from. She could be making it up. So it's it's really disappointing. So um, uh, that's basically the review of the Viking Oracle. Uh, the I want to just comment about the um, the rune cards. Is that there are very few rune cards out there, but there are cards. There are some that you can get, and uh, there are some very good ones out there. And what I'd like to rec uh, I'll just recommend a couple of them. Uh, one of them is the um, Martin Rune Deck. It's an Anglo-Saxon rune deck uh, from Wolfden Designs. And it's created by uh, Alaric Albertson and um, Taryn Martin. And they took a lot of opportunity to really put some good uh, thought into the cards and the artwork. And the first 24 of these uh, correspond with the Elder Futh arc. The designs might be a little bit different because it's Anglo-Saxon, and the meat and the the name of the card will be uh, Anglo-Saxon instead of the ones we're normally used to. But the images are really close. This means cattle. This is far more representing cattle exchange of money. Perfect. Uh, uh, or strength. Uh, the aurochs from the um, European lands. Thorn, meaning uh, a thorn, a uh, thorn bush there. Uh, perfect uh, and beautifully done. Ansu, see, here we go. Now, this is the god Odin speaking to us in communication. That's what it should be about. Now, I did do kind of guess that that other card was similar to that, but this is even far more better. So, that's the Martin Rune deck by um, Albertson and, sorry, I dropped my little easel here. Uh, Martin and Albertson, and you can you can get those now. They're great. Uh, another one is uh, by Freya Aswin. It's called The Runes of Yggdrasil. It's based on artwork that she did herself. This was a limited edition, so you may or may not be able to get this deck. You'd have to connect with her at aswin.com, A-S-W-Y-N-N, -N, to see if she has any available. But um, chances are they may already be sold out, so unfortunately. But it is a cool deck. She painted them all. This is Hagalos. She connects that to Hela. Again, beautiful and decaying. So these are some beautiful cards. Thurisaz, there's Thor holding his hammer. So a great set of cards. 
Finally, what I recommend uh, is The Power of the Runes by oh, Phoenix. There you go, Phoenix. Um, he did a really good job. Um, some of the cards, um, I have to go in and look at what he's pulling into it, but uh, for the most part, uh, not bad. He does include a, a 25th card, but he explains that it is an optional card, so he's not saying it's part of the Fluth Arc, which is good. But like here, we have Rido shows um, Thor being pulled by his goats, uh, showing um, riding, which is travel, which is what Rido is about, which is really good. Urus again, there's the Orox. Uh, Ulthala, or Othala, um, home, inheritance, things like that. So you can really look at these cards and say, ah, I've really got an idea of what the cards mean. And um, so um, one thing that I'll say is that um, the Martin deck is available from Wolf Den Designs, from the, from the creators of it, Power of the Runes. Um, by Phoenix, you can um, get at your local metaphysical shop, and I really do encourage you to try to get things as much as possible from your local your local shops, your stores. See if they can order it because uh, we need them. They're a vital part of our community. They're a vital part of um, uh, keeping our communities going. And if they go out of business, then we lose that connection. And the only way they can stay in business is if we go to them first and we give them the opportunity to order books, order decks. And yes, you're going to pay a little bit more than you would at A to Z or um, any other place. Um, but you know, it's worth it because of the things they do in there. Now, if the item can't be picked up or it's out of print, then um, go to A to Z and um, um, go ahead and get them from there uh, or if you're really on a tight budget and you can find it for such a significant thing then go ahead but if you can try to support your local shop uh, so thank you so much thanks for taking the time I know this is longer than a lot of rune oracles and again like I said this is my first time so I hope that um, this was um, valuable and that some folks um, got something, um, learned something out of it. Uh, one of the things that I will say is that if you just absolutely love this deck, then by all means I say use it. Use it to your heart's content. Use it to uh, divine, to communicate, uh, get the messages that you can get from it. That is awesome. Um, if you're con kind of like the artwork and um, you're just not sure about anything else, um, I would recommend um, setting the book aside. Don't use the book that um, they provided. Uh, just um, go with um, uh, study the runes from other uh, rune authors such as Freya Aswin, Diana Paxson, Andrew Thorson, Katie Gerard has a really good book called Odin's Gateways. It's a very basic primer that I um, recommend as a very basic. Diana Paxson's Taking Up the Runes is a, a very in-depth book and very has a lot of insights from different authors, which is really good. Those are those are two that I, I recommend the most. And um, for the oracle side of it, um, study up the uh, the lore based on what's on the bottom of that card. <clears throat> lore, story, sagas. Uh, look up the Voluspa, the Havamal, uh, the sagas, and um, make those make those cards have special meaning for you and use them. And uh, I recommend that. But overall, um, I just think that um, there was a lot of missed opportunity. But otherwise, uh, um, enjoy it. So um, please check me out at Gifts of the Weird, uh, the podcast. Uh, it's an audio podcast mostly, and uh, this is the first, again, like I said, the first video uh, experiment. Uh, it's an audio podcast. It's at giftsoftheweird.podbean.com, also available on iTunes. And I, again, I'm on Twitter at Weird Gifts and on Facebook at Gifts of the Weird. Uh, drop me a note at giftsoftheweird at gmail.com. And let me know what you think. Uh, hopefully uh, this will be uh, posted up soon. And uh, just really appreciate it. So uh, thank you and um, happy divining.